Management Review Board. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for joining us to conduct business in the Zoom environment. Um, I will introduce my other DRB members. They are Rob Goodwin. Hello. Rob, Kevin O'Connell. Hello. Jean Leon. Hello. Michael Azorchak. Good evening. And we are supported by our zoning administrator, um, Meredith Crandall. Hello. And we're recorded by Orca Media this evening. So um, thank you again all for being here. We will dive into the agenda. Um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as printed? So moved. Motion by Kevin, is there a second? Second. Second. Second by Jean, thank you. I'll call the roll, which we do for all of our votes um, on Zoom. <clears throat> Rob? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Jean? Yes. <clears throat> Michael? Yes. And I vote yes, so we've approved the agenda. Um, as part of the approval of the agenda, I want to I don't I want to raise something that just to make sure our meeting runs smoothly. Um, I'm not sure what the weather is in central Vermont right now where everybody is, but I hear it might be a little wild and woolly. I'm I'm, I'm beaming in from elsewhere um, where it's wild but not woolly. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'd like to do is make a contingency plan in case anyone loses power, any of the participants in this hearing, or if we lose a DRB quorum due to the power outage. Um, our rules of procedure do allow us to continue a hearing to a time and date certain if all the applications cannot be disposed of on the day set. And that would indeed be the case if we lost power. So um, this is a bit unconventional, but um, I think useful. Could I suggest that there be a motion to continue the, the agenda of tonight's meeting to our regularly scheduled July, July 6th, 2021 meeting in the event that technical difficulties keep the applicant interested parties or a quorum of DRB members from participating in tonight's meeting. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. so moved. Motion by Rob. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jean. Thank you. Is there any discussion or questions about that motion or why we're doing it from the board members? No, but it's a good good idea, Kate. I fully support it. Thank you. It was Meredith's idea. <laughs> so credit where credit is due. Um, thank you, then we'll we'll vote. Uh, Rob? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I also vote yes. Thank you all. All right, the next on the item on our agenda is the staff review of remote meeting procedures and process. Um, and during this time, related questions may be asked. For that, I will turn it over to Meredith. Hey, I'm going to share my screen here. And this is mostly for people watching via Orca, but it can sometimes be helpful for people who haven't done a Zoom DRB meeting. Um, can you all see a slideshow? Yeah. All righty. Um, so for anyone viewing this meeting via Orca Media, um, you can participate in tonight's DRB meeting via the Zoom platform um, through either the video or telephone access options shown here. So you can either click this link and be able to go in through the Zoom platform, or you can dial this phone number with this meeting ID number and gain access to listening and speaking. You just won't be able to see the screen, um, although Orca Media will be showing that screen on your TV. Um, if anyone has problems accessing the meeting, please email me. My email address is right here, and I'll leave that up on the screen for a little while. Um, please note that this will be the last probably fully Zoom meeting that we have um, starting in July. At the very least, I will be upstairs in council chambers. So anybody who's gotten used to seeing my office in the background on Orca Media while we do these, that will no longer be the case. Um, right now, the plan is to still stream this and have a Zoom option. Um, but I will be upstairs for anybody who wants to attend in person um, in the council chambers and City Hall will be unlocked at that time. Um, so. Um, do, do, do. If anyone is having difficulties accessing the video conferencing features in Zoom, once they're already in, um, please message me through the chat function in Zoom. Um, this makes sure that that discussion is off to the side. Um, and please use that chat function only for those technical type difficulties. The Zoom meeting is being recorded. Um, turning on your video is optional. Public testimony will be taken verbally. Um, 
Please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This reduces background noise. And uh, as I mentioned to Allison, um, since she's on by phone, anyone participating by phone can use star six to allow you to mute or unmute that. And then also lets anybody in Zoom see that you're muted so we know why you're not answering questions if we've asked them. Um, if someone, I, everyone we have on tonight is on about the same matter, so I'm not gonna go on to the next one. If somebody has a question, um, especially if they're not on video function, um, instead of raising your hand um, in the video, you can press star nine and that will do a little hand flag on Zoom. Um, and you know, if for some reason that's not working either and there's a pause, you can also just unmute yourself and, and ask the, the chair to speak. Once the chair has recognized someone to participate, please make sure to unmute your microphone, confirm that you can be heard, and provide your full name and address for the record if you're not actually the applicant. Um, you'll then be free to provide your questions or comments, and we ask that um, those interested parties aim to keep those initial comments to two minutes. Um, the board members will then have the opportunity to respond to your comments or ask questions of you, and the applicant may also have an opportunity to respond to the board the chair may grant additional time for speakers to have follow-up questions or comments so that two minutes doesn't mean that's all you get to say for the whole hearing. Um, after you have finished, please make sure to mute your microphone again. Um, as Kate mentioned earlier, during this whole Zoom process in general, we have been um, finding that if it turns out that the public is unable to access this meeting and technical difficulties due to power outages, outages would count, but it's also if I get emails from somebody who's trying to get in and they just can't, um, then the meeting will be continued to a time and place certain. If someone is having connectivity issues, try turning off your video or closing other applications on your phone or computer. Um, and for anybody at home or anybody who is tuned in right now and hasn't already downloaded the meeting packet, you can get that here at this link. It's the agendas and meeting minutes page on the city website. Um, and so that's also, you can get there through um, the how do I link on the city's main page. All right, I am gonna hand, oh, forgot the last thing. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be done by roll call vote. I'll now hand this back over to the chair. Great, thank you, Meredith. Okay, um, the next item on the agenda is comments from the chair and I'll share two. One, there is a position open on the DRB, so please tell your friends. Um, it's a really, a really, I think, important way to contribute to the community. So we'd, we'd like to have as, as many diverse voices and experiences represented here. So please do spread the word. Um, I also want to give my general statement that I've been giving at the beginning of the, the Zoom hearings that um, during during the pandemic, during Zoom, we have been conducting our deliberations in a closed deliberative session. And we've been doing this for um, applications, no matter how large, small, simple, or complicated. So um, should, should this application move into deliberation this evening, you'll hear us make a motion to do that in a, in a, deliberate, a separate um, non-public deliberative session. And this is something we've been doing consistently for many months. Um, so I want you to just be prepared for that. It's not a commentary on the application. All right, so moving on, our next item of business is to approve the minutes. We have minutes from May 17th as well as June 7th. And we have, we don't have enough, we still don't have enough DRB members here to approve the minutes from the 17th of May but we can approve the minutes um, from June 7th. I, Rob, Michael, and Jean were all present two weeks ago. So I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of June 7th, 2021. So moved. Motion from Jean, is there a second? Second. Okay, so if those eligible to vote, um, Rob? Yes. Michael? Yes. Jean? Yes. And I also vote yes. So we've approved the minutes of June 7th, 2021. Thank you. All right. So we will turn to our main item on the agenda this evening, which is 14 Liberty Street application from Allison Donovan uh, pertaining to the demolition of part of a historic structure. So here's how I'm going to, um, here's, here's what to expect. 
Um, I will swear in witnesses, anyone who wishes to testify on this application. We'll hear an overview of the project from Meredith. We'll hear an overview from the applicant. And then what I'll do is I'll take initial comments from interested parties. Um, we'll do those for two minutes each. And um, during that, um, if, it, if it doesn't come through otherwise, please identify your specific concerns. What that will allow me to do is uh, hold space as appropriate as we then walk through the staff report and, and go through the different criteria of the zoning that need to be met in order for this project to receive a, a, a permit. Um, and I would just say that when we do do that part of the hearing, please please direct any any questions or comments through the chair rather than having parties talking to each other. That's that's how we tend to run this. Okay, great. So with that, I will swear in the witnesses. Anyone who wishes to speak on this application, please raise their right hand. And I, I know that the people who are phone only are raising their right hands. <laughs> and um, I will ask you to to affirm this. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. I do. Great. Thank you. And um, Brooke, are, are you, do you expect to testify this evening? Well, I wouldn't be testifying. I uh, was here to assist either with cross-examination, uh, raising questions for the chair to ask, or helping to facilitate my clients to testify. So I won't be providing any factual evidence. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. I usually do kind of loop in everyone to that sharing of information testimony. So if, if you are willing to agree to the statement that I just gave that, I would I would appreciate it. And if not, I'll note that for the record as well. Sure, I, I always, I just don't want to go under oath to mislead the tribunal or any participants that my, uh, my legal argument or analysis is the equivalent of evidence. Okay, so am I hearing correctly that if, if you present, um, you are you're going to provide questions and counsel rather than um, argument, for lack of a better word, for or against the whether any particular criteria are met. Well, I intend. I, I hope if you're giving me the opportunity to restate facts in an argument fashion. But my point is, I won't be testifying as a witness, which is that's when you put people under oath because it's the evidence itself that you have to make sure is correct. If I, as an attorney advocating for my client, am restating the evidence, asking questions on cross-examination, that's facilitating the evidence to get to you. So I, I, the Secretary of State does not think it's appropriate for lawyers who are acting as advocates to go under oath because it's, it, we don't want to mislead uh, you know, the folks making the decision that what we're saying is the equivalent of evidence. I'm okay. advocating for my client based on the information presented. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I hear the distinction and I think um, our discussion of this just now has provided a, a good record of what you are and aren't providing this evening. Thank you, thank you, bro. All right, so I've sworn in the witnesses. Um, and now what I would do is turn to Meredith, please, for an overview of the application. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm going to try and stick mostly to the procedural overview here. Um, so as you said earlier, the main issue here is we have um, a proposal that includes demolition of part of a historic structure. Um, and that is why this is coming before the board. It is. We're, we're dealing with the request to demolish a shed that is attached to a barn. The barn is the main entity listed in the National Register of Historic Places, but the shed is described in that description of the barn. Um, and the rest of the application involves moving that barn to another location on the same parcel. Um, if it had been just moving the barn, then that would have been an administrative permit. Um, and there would have been no need for this to come before the DRB. Um, so there's, you know, in the staff report, there, there are some distinction between which provisions apply to which parts of that project. Um, I do want to make one clarifying point. There is an error in my staff report. 
um, where I refer to a um, neighboring parcel as 26 Loomis having having the barn move in front of the 26 Loomis building and closer to that building. Um, it's actually 24 Loomis, which is like a condo that's part of the 26 and 24 Loomis, you know, part there, it's a carriage barn. So it's really 24 Loomis. Just wanted to get that out in the, in the beginning. Um, I think that's, that's the main part of my procedural overview. Okay, great. Um, Thank you, thank you, Meredith. Okay, with that, I will turn to the applicant, um, Allison Donovan. If you'd like, you can to please tell us a little bit about um, about your project. Hi, can everyone hear me? We can. Thank you. Oh, great. Okay. Hi, thank you um, for this meeting. I applied um, for a permit to move my barn. I've been living in that house um, for 16 years and, um, you know, always, always knew that there was going to be a barn project coming. I will admit I went back and forth a couple times, whether to move it or take it down, um, but I was, I was happy to be able to get to a point with contractors and financing to be able to move it and, and save it. So... We recently found out that, as Meredith explained, the shed is part of the historic register. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm here tonight um, to petition and request being able to demolish the shed before moving the barn to a different location in the yard. Great. Okay. Um, before I go on, I'll see, um, do, do DRB members have any questions about the basics that we've heard so far? There will be, uh, go ahead and unmute there, Kevin, please. <laughs> well, thankfully we're not probably going to have another year and a half to practice. So yeah, I guess you're right. I should it's have okay. By now, wouldn't you it's think? okay. Um, so anyway, I get just, just very quickly, I know it's in the application, but what is the dimensions of the, sh just the shed? I think the dimensions of just the shed is 12 by 28. 12 by 20. Thank you. That's it. Thanks. Good. And we'll get into this, some details for um, as, as we continue on, but that gives us a sense of scale. Thank you. Okay. So um, what, what I'm going to do next is um, take some initial comments from interested parties. And would you just do me a favor and raise your hand if, if you're maybe a neighbor or someone else who's interested in this who might like to speak. So I'm seeing Amanda and company, as well as um, Steamer Walk. Great. Um, so I believe that um, the, the Steamer, oh, and Courtney, Courtney Muriel O'Connor as well. Just, oh. sorry? Just Courtney, okay. <laughs> um, so Meredith, um, I, as far as order, who logged on first, do you, do you recall? A steamer did. Okay, so that's what we'll do. We'll go steamer walk, we'll go Courtney, and then Amanda, Amanda Aldridge. So what I would do is I'd invite you to introduce yourself, please provide your address, um, and take about two minutes to tell us um, what you'd like to say about this application. And if you have specific concerns, um, please note them so that we can, as appropriate, revisit them as we go through the staff report, which is what we'll do after. So, so please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Stephen Walker, Steamer as I'm known. Uh, this is my wife Judy next to me. We've we've lived at 12 Liberty Street since 1973, and have watched the uh, the deterioration of the shed mostly, and and somewhat of the barn. And um, I would just like to point out that the the shed was apparently added several years after the barn was built, and it really is just an appendage to the historic structure. I don't, it's old, but it's not historic in any way, and it's about to collapse. One year, early on in our tenure here, uh, snow came crashing down from the roof of the barn onto the shed roof and broke all the, all the beams in the roof and the, should have been taken down then. But we support the application. We'd love to see it rehabilitated and moved and 
That's all I have to say. All right. Thank, thank you very much. And you are both welcome to speak if, if Judy, you'd like to say anything. I'm fine for now. That takes good okay. care of it. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony. So I'll turn next to Courtney. If you'd like to unmute and uh, take about two minutes to. And Kate, if I can just jump in, um, because I am representing Courtney and Amanda just very briefly, um, and then I'll, I'll let them uh, speak about their specific issues. But um, we're very concerned about the demolition of historic structures in uh, Section 3004D2 because it gives the board the opportunity to determine one of two things that would allow demolition of a historic structure. And I don't believe from the materials that we have reviewed that either there's evidence for either prong of that determination. I don't think that the applicant has met their burden of production, even no less the burden of proof here, to either prove that the rehabilitation of the structure or portion thereof would cause undue financial hardship to the owner, or that the demolition is part of a site plan, site development plan and design plan that would provide clear and substantial benefit to the community. Uh, notwithstanding the staff recommendation, which obviously doesn't have a benefit of the evidence presented at hearing, um, it's very important that the board focus on that being the job and the evidence that's been presented has not provided any information uh, such as the factors that you are to utilize to determine those two questions. Um, so that's legally where I think the application is infirmed, but now I'll uh, certainly let Courtney and Amanda speak to the impacts and the concerns that they have. Okay, thank you. Courtney, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm very focused on um, that section of the URD as well. And um, I agree with uh, what our council said about um, having met the burden of proof regarding um, uh, undue financial hardship. And I also see that in the greater context of Montpelier generally, the state of Vermont, et cetera, in terms of the policy goals and you know, the themes that run throughout um, regulations and legislation about what we want here in the city of Montpelier and generally in Vermont. Um, and which speaks to the second half of 1B in terms of um, any substantial benefit to the community. Um, needless to say, um, two of the neighbors are very, very concerned about um, the effect of the dramatic relocation of a historic structure away from its master dwelling to a position on our neighbor's property that would actually evince a different relationship. It would appear to belong to Amanda and Kevin's house or to my property. Um, and it would not exist as a historic structure, which at the time it was constructed, those barns were normally constructed adjoining the master dwelling or very near to the master dwelling. Um, we have a lot of, I personally have a lot of other concerns beyond the historic integrity. I'm very concerned about the effects of the value of my home. I'm very concerned uh, on issues of environmental sustainability. Um, I've asked a number of experts in a variety of disciplines to come into um, my home to assess the effect on my solar gain, mm -hmm. my daylighting. Um, however, the plans are so vague and actually internally um, contradictory that they have said that with those plans, they, they've given me a general sense of the damage that would be done, but with those plans, it's hard for them to assess because they're very vague and they're internally contradictory. Um, I think I mentioned the value of my home and also the enjoyment of my home. I am deeply, deeply concerned about the context in which the request for demolition, a demolition permit has been presented. Thank you. We'll have a chance in a minute for um, DRB members to ask questions um, of the things you just said. So, but um, for now, thank you. And I will um, turn to Amanda um, to take a couple of minutes as well uh, for any comments she would she would like to make. 
Hi. Um, just trying to. Okay. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> um, so I live at 18 Liberty, and my home is um, diagonal currently from the barn, and the prospect is to move the barn behind my house, and the barn is almost as big as my house, if not as big as my house, and it would block my kitchen windows and my dining room windows and potentially my daughter's window to her bedroom that's already blocked by a house on the other side and um, our bathroom window upstairs as well. Um, I have concerns, obviously, like solar gain. Our house is a beautiful, bright house right now, and that's going to completely change. It's not, um, it would be awful. It would definitely affect the property value, and it would definitely affect just my overall enjoyment of my home um, and my plants' enjoyment of my home. Um, yeah, I also feel that the plans aren't very accurate. Like, I feel like, um, they, they don't look dimensionally correct. Like if you look at them, like it makes it seem like the barn's going to be further away from my house when it's going to be like right up against my house, which is really scary to me. Um, yeah. And all the storm water runoff. Oh yeah. And the storm water runoff, um, is potentially a huge issue because we already have issues with, um, water going into our basement. And I'm really concerned about that. Um, yeah, sure. Hi, sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. My name you is are well, You are welcome. You're welcome to join us. Sorry, oh, well, I interrupted you. you. I am I am Amanda's. We finally got married after four years of engagement. But um, so we have been living here for a little bit. We've been in Vermont for six years. Um, I do have a few different concerns regarding the movement of the barn. Looking at the stormwater runoff, um, you know, I, I do have some concerns about with such a large structure with a standing seam roof and us as, you know, technically actually a more historic structure that was built earlier than the barn itself. Um, and we have a dry stone laid foundation. The amount of groundwater that we're already dealing with close enough to a floodplain or flood zone is going to be greatly exacerbated by a large structure that is then draining water here. Um, I you know, beyond beyond all of the other reasons that Amanda came up with, just now that we're all extremely, I mean, valid in everything else, the big thing that I'm worrying about is the structural safety of my own home. And, you know, going forward, the idea that this whole motion is over the idea of a historic home when the home that is in jeopardy is actually technically older than it, I think... Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know. I just have a few objections to that, but um, I'll leave it to you guys anyways. Um, and so I guess I just would love for an environmental engineer to come check out the space to check out the wastewater runoff as well as um, having a historic, um, a person who knows about historic homes um, be able to check out the space and see if it would be all right to have it moved because I don't think that, it would be an effective use of space for us, for sure. We don't want that to happen. Um, okay. Thank you. I'll let you guys go. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. It's okay. Thank you, Amanda. And I want to make sure I caught the name of, of your partner. Was it Jason? Kevin. Kevin. K-E-V-I-N at Coughlin, C-O-U-G-H-L-I-N. Okay, great. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, no All right. Hey, Kate, this is Brooke. Yes, uh, Brooke. Just for orientation purposes, so Amanda and Kevin's house is actually it was built on the property boundary is my understanding so yeah. the uh, five foot setback when one would normally think of maybe you would have that setback at least on either side of a boundary line that's not the case so um, it's particularly concerning there uh, and then courtney's house is on, is on the back lot line of the subject property built how far off courtney Maybe you're muted. You're muted. Um, sorry. So the setback is 10 feet and my house is um, three feet from the property line. My mm -hmm. concern is not wastewater, but a massive concern about solar gain and daylighting loss. Yeah, well, okay. you, uh, they're saying wastewater. They mean stormwater. Sorry. They said stormwater. Sorry, um, I made the mistake. 
<laughs> sorry. Um, okay, great. Well, thanks, thanks, folks, for for, for providing some overviews um, to provide some context, situational context as, as we move into the criteria. So our, our job as the DRB, as I'm sure you all know, um, is to look at the zoning and look at the standards that are available to us um, in order to assess whether the project as proposed meets those standards. And as a development review board, there is some amount of discretion, but we also have the sort of the legislative, we have, we have the law um, to go by. So that's what we're gonna be looking at when we go through the staff report. Um, what I would like to do, what I would like to do now is um, see if DRB members have any questions for any of the any of the folks who just provided testimony, um, and we'll we'll spend maybe five or ten minutes on that, and then we'll walk through the staff report, which which will answer a lot of questions as well. Um, but but let, I, I just want to take our time to get the lay of the land, um, literally and figuratively. So um, Rob, please go ahead. Um, just so the record's clear, could um. Amanda and Kevin, uh, just like describe and point out which house there is theirs. Sure. Maybe Meredith, could you could you share the site plan with us, or one one piece of it? This is the part of the meeting where I put Meredith on the spot. Thank you, Meredith. Sorry. Hold on one second. My copy of the full packet went away. Um, while you're do while you're doing that, I will um, I'll welcome another DRB member who folks haven't been introduced to yet. Joe Th Joe Kiernan is on the DRB. Um, thanks. Good to see you, Joe. I do have a question. Where are you? Sure. Let's um. Thanks, Dean. Let's um. Let's get Rob's question answered, and then we'll. And you can go next. Okay. So this is the new proposed site plan here, and I believe that Amanda's house, Amanda and Kevin's house, is here, right here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Courtney's. So this is, you know, what the site plan says. It's you know, it's not. It's not a surveyed site plan. Um, go down, it says Karen's house and Pink House. Pardon? If you go scroll down to the next page, it says Karen's house and Pink House. I just wonder which one is, which one is which. Maybe you go down another page. Uh, house uh, was 21. Karen's house. <laughs> yeah. So there. So Amanda, your house was Karen's house. Yes. Yes. So that oh, yeah. was perfect. Thank you. Okay, and You're while welcome. we're while we're on this picture, I just want to observe. Um, we've got vertical lines going up and down through these. That's an indication of the roof line. So does that mean that these these both drain off in the same direction and not towards each other? Is that what's represented on that diagram? And maybe that's a question for Allison. Or <clears throat> I don't think Will is here, right? Will Shabon? No, Will not. Okay, we, um, we can leave. Looking looking at Google Earth, yeah, that's the peak of the roof line there. Peak, that is the word I was looking for. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Great, appreciate that. Um, all right, Jean. So, uh, I just have a question for the applicant. Um, so what is the gain of, rather than revitalizing or restoring the existing historic barn, removing the shed because it seems like it's a hazardous at this point, um, as your neighbor suggested, um, what what is the gain of moving it rather than restoring it in its present location? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, well, this this barn has been uh, a long long project. Uh, talked to the credit union, the city police credit union about it several times. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to pause you if I can, Allison, um, a couple of folks okay. are having trouble hearing you. It's just a little a little blippy the way that cell phones can be. So um, if you wouldn't mind trying again and I don't know, maybe hold the phone a little closer to your mouth if you wouldn't mind. And you were you can said, you hear um, me? <laughs> yes, can you hear me? yes. And I heard you say the barn's been a long project and you were talking to the credit union. 
Go ahead. Thanks. Here. Um, basically, I can't get along uh, with in 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 sixteen liberty. I think um, is has encroached on I'm my so property. Allison, I'm so sorry to interrupt you again. It's I don't think it's your fault. I think it's a technology issue. Um, it's some folks can hear you and some some folks can't. Um, let's see. I'll look to Meredith. Do you think it's useful for for Allison to hang up and call back in or? Um, um, yeah, I mean, Allison, is there any way you can get to a landline instead of a cell phone? Oh yeah, no, the connection isn't. Um, it, it, it's not getting better. It's getting it's getting worse. And we're going to blame it on the weather. Yeah. Um, these these things do happen. Um, tell you what, let me. I think this is an important question, and I, I don't want to to miss a, a complete answer. Um, I'm going to propose to turn it off and turn it back on again method of, of technological repair as, as the best thing I can think of. So Allison, I'm so sorry, would you, would you be willing to hang up and call back in and, and we'll give that a try and we'll, we'll hold your thought and the question until you're able to return. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your patience. So we'll just wait a minute while Allison hangs up and then dials back in. Um, is everybody else, I guess I'm the only one talking, but is every, is there things coming through all right? Yeah, may, may I ask a question? Um, if it's a procedural question, yes. 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 Yeah. Um, just um, could we clarify how close um, when Allison moves the barn, if she does, um, away from its historic location, up against our property lines. Let's uh, let's uh, get to that when she comes back. That's okay. um, that's a facts of the case question. Okay. Um, I should have said but, but what procedural means sort of logistics of the meeting. Sorry. That. That's okay. That's all right. It's a good. It's um. We'll, we'll make sure that there is, is is space for that question. Allison, welcome back. Hi, um, I will say that I did get stranded because of thunderstorms and wasn't able to get back. Um, so I do apologize for the bad cell phone connection. We understand. Can't be helped. Um, thanks for, for calling in the weather. All right, so um, I'm gonna back up a little and I'm gonna count on Gene to nod. Um, I want to reiterate his question, which was, "What's the gain rather than restoring the barn in the existing location? Why would you why, why move it instead of restoring it in an existing location?" We heard um, that you talked to the credit union. You can't get a loan with the barn in its current location, and that's the last we heard. Okay, um, I'm, the the home next door had built an addition within one foot of the barn. I'm not sure when that happened but it's been there the whole time I've lived there. The addition encroaching on the barn has prevented me from getting a new loan, 30 year mortgage from the credit union. It also makes restoring the barn in place impractical. Um, and if it had to stay in place, more expensive. You cannot um, paint the backside of the barn because of the proximity to the house next door. Um, and also I, I can't get a mortgage with it there. Okay, thank you. Um, we heard you, that worked, thank you. Thank you um, very much. Sure. Um, do you have cost estimates, Allison, for what it would cost to restore the barn in place compared to moving it to restore it? I don't have those exact numbers. Okay. 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 Thanks. So I'm going to proceed with having um, DRB members ask ask some any clarifying cl questions of, of from anyone we've heard from so far, and then we'll we'll, we'll do that for a few more minutes, and then go into the staff report. So are, do DRB members have any more questions? Okay. 
I guess I, I have one question and it's for Allison. Um, we, and this, the question also had some information in it, um, I'd like Meredith to, to affirm, we are, we are reviewing the moving of the barn and we are treating the barn as an accessory structure. Um, an accessory structure has a certain set of rules within the zoning bylaw as far as what standards it does or doesn't need to meet. Um, so I want to confirm with the applicant that this will indeed be an accessory structure once it's been moved or, or whether it will be something else. So Allison, could you tell us how the barn is going to be used once it's moved? It's going to be used as a barn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions from DRB members? Uh, Rob, you want to unmute? Yeah, I got a follow up to that. Um, sure. So, a barn, is that a listed use? Um, like what? Maybe Meredith can help out what the planned use is for, uh, you know, for this. Uh, I'm guessing not residential is what she means by um, the barn, but. Uh, so is that a question for me, Rob? Uh, yeah, you can answer it first of what the proposed use would be. Well, well, do you want to propose what the barn is being proposed to use be used as or how the regulations deal with barns? Which of those? The, reg the regulations question is for you. The uh, maybe a little elaboration is for uh, is for, for Allison. Do you want me to go One first? Second. Yes, please. OK, so. A barn is one of those items that is specifically listed as a accessory structure. So this is not something that is listed in the use table, right? It's in section 3003. Um, when you look at the accessory structures and uses within setbacks for principal buildings, it's under figure 3-07. And these are just examples, um, but the, the garages, carports, it says pole barns, but it's a barn, and similar large accessory structures, right? So there, we have all sorts of uses that are accessory to residential uses. Parking, you know, a, a garage, a storage shed, a barn, these are all dealt with, with as accessory structures in that depending on how they fall into this chart, they may not have to meet the principal structure setbacks or other principal structure dimensional requirements. Um, but this is not something, the, the barn, if the barn had a, a another primary dwelling unit in it, right? If it was being converted and gonna be used as a new third dwelling unit, it would no longer really be an accessory structure because it's being used for the primary use on the parcel as a whole, which is residential. Um, but you know, even a even a you know commercial entity might have some accessory structures, sheds, and things that would fall into these categories. Okay, thank you. And the applicant previously did state that it would be an accessory structure, so that's good enough for me. Thanks, Rob. I see that Kevin's unmuted. Did you have a question, Kevin? No, I'm sorry. I was uh, scratching. Okay, you unmuted. <laughs> um, and. Um, Allison, did you want to um, clarify anything based on Rob's question just now? No, okay. thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, Brooke, I see that you have your hand up. So I think what I'm going to do is take your question, see if I have other questions from DRB members, and then we're going to move into the staff report. So please go ahead, Brooke. Um, thank you. I, I had a question um, because while um, maybe a 30-year refi or mortgage for refinance couldn't be obtained it appears that the materials that were provided to the drb from the credit union indicated while you're not going to qualify for a 30-year refinance on this they actually did provide a credit line to uh, uh equity loan for the moving of the barn it looks like fifty thousand dollars so it doesn't seem to be uh, accurate um, to suggest that financing couldn't be obtained. It just maybe not would not be the most advantageous financially. Okay. Um, um, perhaps so I could 
Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt if, you, sorry. If, if that could be clarified, because the materials seem to be at odds with the notion that this can't be, no loan could be gotten to do anything. Okay. So, um, Allison, could you please clarify? I would note that in the application materials, there is discussion of the 30 year mortgage that couldn't be obtained for the whole property. There's discussion of the line of credit that was, and which I, um, maybe you could tell us why that, why that was granted and how it will affect your financing on the parcel overall. Yes, that's, that's accurate. I can get a home equity loan to move the barn, but I cannot get a 30 year mortgage because of the encroachment issues of the home next door. So um, does that mean that, does that mean that if you wanted to refinance your home or if you were selling your home and someone else was trying to get a mortgage, that it would not be possible to get a mortgage? Yes, that's it exactly. Okay. Okay. And, um, I will acknowledge that these questions stretch a bit beyond um, what we usually ask about at, at the DRB, but because one of the tests uh, having to do with demolition of a historic structure is the financial um, burden. It's not the exact word, but um, that, that is why we're, we're talking about this. So, um, okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to, uh, Amanda, I see you have your hand up. I'm gonna check in with DRB members before I come back to you. So, um, DRB members, do you have other questions? Thanks for clarifying that, Kate. On the last. Oh, sure. That, no, that was a that was a, a a team effort between Brooke's question and Allison's answer. And thank you. Um, okay, so I'll take Amanda's question. If it generates questions from DRB members, we'll we'll do that. And but otherwise, I'm going to move to the staff report um, after that. So, Amanda, please go ahead. Um, I just had a question. Um, so. I, I understand not being able to get the 30 year fixed mortgage, um, but does the barn actually have to be, could the barn be moved one foot over or does, can the barn be moved in a way that it wouldn't be so damaging to Courtney and I's experience of life? <laughs> um, and then beyond that, um, could we get more clarification about um, potentially more information from the bank about what needs to be done? Um, so I will ask Allison to answer, um, ha what options she had and how she decided to make the choice she made in order to solve the 30 year mortgage question. Okay. Um, Thank you. the contractor that I'm working with, um, did submit a letter which stated you know, if the barn must stay in place, he would have to move it first over to the back of the yard before a proper foundation could be installed. And then he would have to move it back. So that would incur more cost. And was it content? Ooh. You're moving it back in one direction towards the, some of the other homes. Is mm -hmm. it possible, or fr from your perspective, is moving the barn toward your? I think it's toward your driveway, um, so perpendicular to the direction you're moving it um, to remedy the the issue of being too close to the other property. Was that something that you considered? And if if so, if, if not, why not? I guess. Well, it would still need to be moved to where there is no structure. So if it gets moved, you know, towards Judy and Steamer's house, it would first have to get moved to where there is nothing, you know, where the green glass is. Then, then a foundation would be installed and then it would have to be moved back. I see. So the current proposal involves building a foundation and then moving the barn from point A to point B on top of the new foundation. If you did something different, you would be talking about moving it from point A to point B while the foundation get the new foundation gets built and then over to point C where the new foundation is. Is that what I'm hearing you say? So there would be two moves instead of one of the building? 
That's it, exactly. Okay. Okay. Good. So we're going to get into some of these details and dimensional pieces as, as we go through. And I think, um, Courtney, maybe you could tell me the topic of your question, then I can make sure that we incorporate it into the staff review that we're about to go through. Okay, it relates to the information that Allison just gave us, and then I'm happy to have it answered later, which is, <clears throat> as someone who owned a historic home in a historic district for 25 years and had to make a lot of decisions, because that's what that's how it is with historic properties, is an additional cost an undue financial hardship? That's my question. And that can be answered later, happily. Thank you. I think that goes in the category of um, questions for the board to, to consider as it evaluates the criteria. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. What we're going to, Amanda, I see you still have your hand up, but I don't know if that's left over or if it's, um, if I'm missing you. Um, my partner did want to say something. Um, oh, okay, the, sure. Um, last comment, and then we're gonna we're gonna move into the details. Right. Here it goes. Okay. You want to? I guess he doesn't want to say anything anymore. Okay. All right. Um, there there will be other opportunities. I don't know what I missed. I don't want to be. Okay. Kate, hey, can I just ask a super quick question? Super quick. Um, we're just curious. Um, it appears from what we've discerned that there is an existing mortgage on the property. So the question about, well, um, you know, couldn't get a mortgage on this property. I had to wait until there was a chance. Sounds Thank like the for. subject property and its current owner has a current mortgage. Is that correct? Um, I don't, I don't know. So I'm going to put that question to Allison um, and, and then we'll move on. So um, Allison, could you speak to that please? Yeah, um, what happens, I, I have learned, is if an appraiser notes encroachment on an appraisal and gives it to the bank, at least to the credit union, um, and I think the particular mortgage products that I was applying for, HFA, um, it, that um, precludes a 30 year mortgage. If there is a note from an appraiser that says encroachment, the bank will not give me a 30 year mortgage. Okay. Um, is, were you able to obtain a mortgage when you purchased that, the home? I did. Okay. So, um, was could you tell us why that was possible? And um, I do feel like I'm prying, uh, so thank you. But this helps. Kate, us this is Michael. Hey, Kate, do you mind if I interrupt you real quick? Um, go ahead. I, I do want to get like... to the. I do want to get to the answer to this, Michael. Um, but but go ahead. I, unless Meredith can weigh in, otherwise, I I feel like we're getting way beyond the scope of this permit. And personally, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable with the amount of questions we're asking the applicants' finances. I don't feel like this is necessarily appropriate. Okay. And I think we should move on to the permit itself. And if the questions come up in the scope of that review, mm -hmm. then we can go further. But I feel like we're very far afield from how we've treated other permits. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I've, I've been pursuing this on the line of, um, we're looking at financial hardship as an argument for needing to take the barn down, um, but I, I want to look to DRB members and look for a nod or a shake of the head um, regarding Michael's comment. Do you agree that um, as appropriate, we should take these up as we go through the staff report? Well, uh, if you mean take these up as the, in the totality of the financing options, I think I agree with Michael in that uh, we are getting far afield here. I think okay. that there's a, there's a, it can be considered within the context of what the permanent request is but uh I, th I think we i think we're going into places that uh uh that are further than we should okay in that case let's pull ourselves back closer to the context of the permit request i, I do think we'll find that a lot of what we've discussed applies to the criteria we need to evaluate um but in in the event that we're getting too far afield um hewing to the staff report and to the requirements we need to follow is is, is a good policy so we're, we're going to move in that direction now um, Brooke, I, I'd, I'd really, I'd like to get to your, your question as, as we go along. Um, can I just ask one procedural question at this juncture? Yes. 
It's really unclear from the application, but what is the application request? Is this a request for a hardship decision or the other option, which is a substantial benefit? Which, which are we doing tonight as the decision that you're making? Because I agree, you don't want to talk about finances if that's not what the applicant is arguing and trying to get approval on. It's one or the other. So which proceeding are you doing? And that way you'll know exactly what the scope is. I'm asking financial questions because it appears that that's being talked about. So um, Meredith's gonna rejoin us in, in a second, but what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I'm gonna look at 3004D2 and read it to you. The demolition or replacement of historic of any structure or portion thereof listed as a contributing structure on the Vermont Historic Sites and Structure Survey and the National Register of Historic Resources is prohibited unless the Development Review Board approves the demolition and site restoration plan and the board finds rehabilitation would cause undue financial hardship to the owner or the demolition, a demolition provides a clear and substantial benefit to the community. In, in my mind, that is, and I would like Meredith to comment on this, in my mind, that is at the board's discretion to look at the, at the application to determine the circumstances that apply. But Meredith, please tell me um, how you are reading it. Um, so it, it is at the board's discretion in when I get these permit applications, um, you know, I let applicants know what the standards are. Um, in general, the, the financial burden has um, some degree, a, a little bit clearer scope of what goes into that, even if it is a really long list and the board has an opportunity to just consider all of those elements. Um, and so the, I, I have just found over time that that is where applicants tend to be able to have inf information that they can present to you. Um, and, and, but you have the option to look at it either way. The applicant doesn't necessarily have to pick one or the other of those as long as during the, in the application and during the public hearing process, you get the evidence you need to decide when, whether or not they fit in either of those options. Either, either both or neither, yes. Okay, thank you. So what, what I would like to do is, is move move to the staff report and I'm going to start the, the, the staff reports in, in order of the zoning bylaw. I'm going to start with the demolition piece because the application is for the demolition of a historic structure. Um, so if that, if that pleases the board, I'm going to look to my board members for a nod. Shall we, shall we get into that? Thank you. Okay. Yes. All right. So um, the part of the staff report that I'm going to walk through begins on page four of that staff report. So um, the demolition, the requirements are that there be a demolition and site remediation plan describing the intended use of the site and the manner in which the site shall be graded, resurfaced, landscaped and or screened to minimize visual adverse visual impacts and secured to present hazard, goodness, sorry, secured to prevent hazard to public safety and adjoining properties. So um, I would like the, the application packet tells us that the larger application package serves as the site remediation plan. Um, I'm interested in hearing more from Allison about um, the manner in which the site shall be returned to grade, surface and landscaped, and what's being done to minimize adverse visual impacts prevent hazards to public safety and adjoining properties. And if you could point us to the parts of the packet that, that tell us where, where that's happening, that would be very helpful. Um, and I can repeat this question too, but it, I would also like to know the exact measurement between the barn and the, um, not Karen's house, um, Amanda and Kevin's house, because I see the five foot setback, but not an actual measurement on the site plan. You're talking about the shed demolishing the shed. Sorry, um, I'm talking about, oh, Meredith needs to speak up because I think your question, yeah, go ahead, Meredith. We are just evaluating the demolishing of the shed at this time. Demolition. That provision is just about demolition of the shed. It has nothing to do with actually moving the barn. Thank you, thank you. I, I misspoke, I conflated. 
So we're talking about the removal of the shed. So um, yes, please, please do um, elaborate on what the demolition, demolition and site remediation plan are and what's being done in the demolition of the shed to prevent hazards to public safety and adjoining properties. And, and I'll turn that over to you, Allison. Um, well, the contractor that I hired, um, I have told him, you know, obviously it's a tight site. We need to make sure um, it's, it's very quick. The materials are removed quickly, but I don't think I included that specific remediation plan in my application. I don't have those specifics in the application right now okay. on exactly how it will be done, what materials will be used, and the procedure that will be followed. I, I don't realize I needed specific information from my tractor in the application. Okay. Um, questions from board members or about that? May I ask you the contractors? That's a valid question. Jason Merrill. Okay. Mm. Rob, did you have a question? Um, I'll wait till the appropriate time. I think we're getting there. Okay. I'm sure we are. Great. Um, okay. Are, do board members feel satisfied that they have enough information to uh, assess this, that this has been provided? I, I feel mean, that I, I need to, yeah, go ahead, Rob. Well, I just wanted to point out, I would note that um, I think any reference in this process uh, to uh, there being an encroachment or a property line, I just would say that I don't feel like the information will be provided tonight, the qualified people tonight, um, to be able to consider that factor has anything to do with financial hardship, because um, that's not something that appears to have been determined by a uh, you know, professional. And that may be irrelevant, but um, I've heard the word encroachment. I've heard, you know, a letter from the bank. Um, but, um, I, you know, neither of those processes uh, have put into, into the record as a fact that um, that there is an encroachment over the property line. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, throw that out there um, as a concern for me. And I would voice not to um, consider, you know, anything related to encroachment in our deliberations Part of this process and, and you know if they would like to um we would probably need to you know get more information from a professional okay and by a professional are you talking about are you interested in seeing a surveyed um a, a site we can't I think, I think that the um that the, that the applicant if they are preparing to use the term encroachment um and have have it be you know stated as fact in the record that there is an encroachment, I, I, I would I leave it to the applicant to get legal counsel, whether that means a survey or whether, uh, you know, an, an opinion, like, I'm not really sure. I think that you know, there's any number of, uh, <laughs> um, you know, possibilities or, you know, potentially other remedies that they could go for. So um, I, I don't, I don't know. Okay. But uh, I guess this is Allison. Sorry. Sure, that's go ahead, Allison. The, that's a word the bank used. Okay. I, I guess my point being is, is that if we're considering that letter from the bank, um, if, if someone were, were to come in and come to determination that there was not an encroachment and the bank saw that, um, you know, evidence, um, then uh, potentially it seems like uh, the bank wouldn't, you know, see there was an encroachment and it would resolve the financing issue. I mean, it, it, from the information provided, it appears that the encroachment um, is, uh, you know, the only mechanism which is triggering the financing um, troubles. Um, is is there evidence in the materials provided from the appraisers that an encroachment is present on the property? Is is that evidence in the packet? As we do in the full packet, have have something from the appraiser, I believe. Meredith, could you point us in the right direction, please? So, are you meaning like, do they have? I mean, there's not. It's not as far as I could tell, and I tried to read the whole thing. Um, it's not giving like title and deed references necessarily um it is it is making the professional opinion of an appraiser that 
the the there's that there that there's a violation of the zoning regs in how close those two buildings are. Um, you know, because that's that's what an encroachment is in the the terms of there, as far as I was able to tell. I'm not I'm not an appraiser. I don't have that training. Um, you know, I think my suggestion would be, and this is not saying that what Rob said doesn't have any validity whatsoever, is to make sure that the board looks at all of the different factors to be considered when making the financial hardship determination. There's a whole long list of them, mm -hmm. um, but I do, you know, I, I, I think that the encroachment as termed in, in the appraiser's report may be a term of art that they mean. I just, I don't know. I mean, okay. Term. I honestly, right. no, I don't know what those standards are. Okay. No. Well, let's be careful not to speculate on that. Um, I, I would like to keep moving through the, the criteria because there will be the financial um, hardship test. Um, right now, what we are looking at is my documents here. Um, we are confirming that the application includes certain, certain pieces. Um, we haven't gotten into the criteria yet. Um, and so what I'm hearing from DRB members is there's some question as to whether we have sufficient information in this demolition and site remediation plan. And we are question and we also um, are unclear as to whether there is sufficient evidence that demolition or rehabilitation of the structure would cause undue financial hardship to the owner. Um, we're talking about whether we have evidence as a board to make decisions. Um, is, is that Board members, do you want to weigh in on that? Do you feel we have, are you, Rob is questioning whether there's adequate evidence about the encroachment piece of financial burden. I'm, I'm in agreement with Rob on that. Um, I think that uh, <clears throat> since the term is used uh, and is now part of the public record that uh, uh, we have to fully explore it, the encroachment issue which may mean that a uh, uh, surveyed site plan might need to be prepared. Right, and as Meredith noted, there are other criteria and ways in which we evaluate financial hardship. We are talking about the mortgage as one piece where we've gone, a we've gone pretty deep on that already. Um, I want to get to the other parts of, of that financial hardship test um, to understand what information we do and don't have. Um, I. I want to get through a couple more things before I, I take questions. I do want to keep the discussion going um, amongst all of us, but I, I want to move through the staff report just a little more. I, I acknowledge, Brooke, that your hand is up, and I will not forget that. All right, so we've talked about whether we have adequate evidence. Um, per 3004 CL, demolition must be completed within 60 days of commencement. Um, Allison, could you verify that that would be the case? that the building would be demolished within 60 days and remediate and removed within 60 days of commencement. Yep. Yes. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, the board uh, and this, now I'm looking at the top of page five of the staff report, um, text of 3004 D2, um, which is what we must find as a board. We must find that um, we must, it is prohibited, demolition is prohibited unless the DRB approves the demolition and site restoration plan and the board finds that rehabilitation of the structure or a portion thereof would cause undue financial hardship to the owner or the demolition is part of a site development and design plan that would provide clear and substantial benefit to the community. So the next piece of our zoning bylaw are the factors that we can consider um, in deciding whether there is financial hardship that is undue. And I would like to get into that, um, but I, I'm gonna pause and first take questions from the board and then and then um, address, acknowledge Brooks raised hand. So questions from the board. All right, um, Brooke, did you um, want to add something before we were going into the considerations uh, to find undue financial hardship? 
No, it was just about the encroachment issue. Um, the materials I themselves, I, I don't think you need to dig any further into that because the materials themselves actually show that financing is available on the property and is being provided. That's how the applicant is actually going to be moving the structure. Excellent. And so the notion that I don't like this kind of financing, I'd rather have a refinance of a long-term debt thing. Well, she may, may be able to do that after she cures this encroachment, if it is one. But the evidence that's before you says she can get financing. You don't, you don't need to find out that one particular kind of financing isn't available. 15 year variable. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the discussion of the encroachment and the mortgage at that, you know, as, as we previously discussed. Um, I'll take a, a, brief, a brief comment from Steamer and then we'll go into the criteria for undue financial hardship. So please go ahead and unmute and um, can remark. Got it. Um, I just wanted to point out that there, there's a significant difference in terms of hardship between a fixed 30 year mortgage and a line of credit, which, which typically lasts a year. And you're, if you can't refinance it at the end of the year, it's big hardship. Okay. And, and with respect to the encroachment, I would suggest if somebody got out a tape measure and walked over the property, and I could do that right now and measure the distance between 16 Liberty Street and the barn, that would be issued. That question would be solved. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right, um, board members, we're going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, we're going to, proceed. Um, I know this meeting's gone long and I recognize that, that we've lost one of our, one of our parties. Um, I hope they will be in touch if, if they can. Um, <clears throat> if, if it pleases the board, what I'd like to do is go through the consideration of the factors beginning in the middle of, of page five of the staff report. Um, and we can, board members can ask questions ab about these factors. Um, and that, that is what we'll do. So, um, when considering the finding of undue financial hardship for income producing properties, we can consider the following. And we'll ask Allison about each of these. Um, the applicant's knowledge of the property's historical significance at the time of acquisition or if its status subsequent to acquisition. So Allison, were you, when you purchased the property, were you aware that it was historic, a historic property? I was not. You're not. Okay. Um, we also consider the structural soundness of the building or any structures on the property and their suitability for rehabilitation. So we, we have some information in our packet, but um, Allison, could you just briefly tell us about the suitability for rehabilitation of the shed, which is the part we're talking about now? The, the, the shed is um, in very bad shape. The um, exterior wall has disconnected from the sill. Um, there's there's water, standing water in the, inside the barn. Um, in the spring, it's, um, I, there are pictures in, in the packet that show how far beyond repair it is. Okay. And was it, what was the state of that shed when you purchased the home? Um, it was, um, it, it was not in such bad shape, um, mm -hmm. but it was, it was never, um, fully attached to a sill or really a usable space. Okay. Thank you. Um, if the shed were to be rehabilitated and made beautiful and sturdy, what would there be, what would the economic impact be on your property? I haven't gotten the cost okay. to rehabilitate the shed. Okay. Would it increase the property, your property value to rehabilitate the shed? 
uh, would it would it provide I, additional leasing space or anything of that sort? Don't think so. Okay, thanks. I should have read the criterion that I'm asking about. It's the where consideration is of, of the economic feasibility of rehabilitation or reuse of the existing property in the case of a proposed, proposed demolition. Um, okay, so I'm going to pause there and see if board members have questions about those considerations or want additional information from the applicant in order to consider them. Okay. Rob? I mean, I just, uh, as a temperature, you know, check here, uh, I look through the staff before and I've seen what's been presented. Um, I just, I don't know, would put it to the applicant. I, I don't, I don't have the information or feel like I'm going to get the information tonight to be able to make a decision um, and would entertain the option of uh, continuing to the next hearing to work on uh, you know, sort of detailing that, you know, reasons for this exemption, uh, maybe getting, you know, professional, you know, assistance um, to prepare that argument. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the, the questions from the, from the neighbors and the community were, you know, were good and that's feedback. And um, I would, you know, pause to say that, uh, yeah, just again, I don't feel like uh, we're going to get to where we need to tonight and I'd rather not waste people time and, mm -hmm. um, you know, have the, have, have more information. Okay. Thanks, Rob. I appreciate that comment. Um, I thank you for zooming us out a little bit. Um, that is totally appropriate um, because what we're doing is deciding if we have the information to make the decision and before we can make the decision. So I'm hearing from one board member that more information is needed. And I'd like to hear from other board members if you feel additional information is needed. Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to support Rob's uh, comments. I, 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 I'm in agreement with the fact that we do not have the information uh, necessary to make the, even the most fundamental uh, decisions tonight. Um, there needs to be a lot more specific, specificity as to why the uh, barn is being proposed to be in the location that's being proposed. Uh, and things of that nature. And I'm very concerned about the uh, the encroachment issue. Uh, I think we need to have a, a much better idea as to what the uh, uh, the actual border lines are. Okay. So I believe that the main thing we are able to evaluate based on the standards in front of us has to do with the demolition of the historic structure. I'm going to look to Meredith, um, but as far as evaluating the location of the barn, um, that is being moved. Um, if I'm looking at the black and white of our zoning bylaw, we, we do not have the authority to do site plan review because this is a one or two family dwelling. Um, we do have as part of the application site plan um, for the future location, if that's going to, uh, that should have more detail on it um, than what exists. But Meredith, chime in here, go ahead. I'm sorry, because you said site plan in two different ways. <laughs> oh. no You're right, I did, I did. No. Um, but if you're concerned with regard to the getting a survey so that you can judge the financial hardship aspect better, that's separate. I would just not use the site plan language Thank for that. You. Um, you know, under removing the barn, there are other provisions to be weighed that we haven't gotten into at all um, that are in the chapter 300 that are in you know, mentioned in the staff report that we haven't discussed okay. yet. Um, Let, so go ahead. Let's get to that in a second. So what, what I'd like to do is um, I would like to let uh, DRB members identify what additional information we need to evaluate the demolition of the historic structure um, in order to ascertain financial hardship. If the argument is regarding encroachment and the mortgage, the board is, seems to be asking for additional information to verify that an encroachment is in fact occurring. So that's one piece of additional information. The other thing that we have not seen is estimated costs to repair the, the shed that's falling down, estimated costs to move the barn from point A to point B, and estimated costs for what it would be if it were a point A to point B to point C. That is a, a comparison that we are talking about, I, be, I believe, in, in this. Is that... Can I ask a question? Um, I, I want to clarify. Yes, go ahead, Gene. Go ahead. You keep, so are we ta you're talking, uh, you're, you're not revitalizing 
rehabilitating the shed that's being demolished. That's the proposal. Does, right. Does, does the applicant want it? Because the, the language is a little confusing. Does the applicant want another shed? To want to rehabilitate, or is this because of no? But what I'm reading uh, from the application, it's not the that. the fiscal the fiscal the undue financial impact has to do with what it would cost the applicant to rehabilitate the shed versus taking it down. So that's that's what's before us in understanding. Meredith, would you like to go I ahead? Oh, me, sorry, Jean. Because Rob made his point and, and Kevin as well. I I I, I personally think I have significant evidence or information from the applicant to present that or differentiate the cost factors on one versus the other. It's, it's pretty obvious to me. Related to the shed itself, Correct. not the barn. Correct. So Jean, Jean feels he has sufficient evidence. Meredith, and then Kevin. Um. It, it, you know what, keep, keep going, because I, okay. I I think my brain's getting a little convoluted right now. That's okay. A complicating factor in this application is that we're really reviewing the shed and it implicates the rest of it. And we as a board need to have a good understanding of what we're reviewing at what time. When we're talking about financial hardship, we're talking about the shed itself. Okay. Kevin? No, I don't have anything further at this time, uh, Kate. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. I guess I'll go All ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I oh, actually Joe, have a question you. kind of for, for Rob and Kevin. Um, is the encroachment question, uh, what are you trying to determine exactly? Are you trying to determine if it's legally encroachment or if the buildings are too close to each other? I, or, I'm not sure exactly what, what exactly you're looking for when you ask for documentation or a survey on the encroachment. Right, because those those could be two different things. The buildings could be too close together without there being a step over the property line, mm -hmm. or there could be a step over a property line and buildings that are too close together. Is what I'm hearing you say, Joe? What? In, in short, kind of. my what my my thing is is that if in, if the existence of an encroachment is being used as an argument for financial hardship, um, we need clear evidence that an encroachment uh, you know exists. I don't really care actually if the survey comes to us or not stop talking about the encroachment. I just think that, uh, you know, that remedy due diligence, due diligence needs to be done with the bank, um, to evaluate whether there's an encroachment or not and whether, um, you know, financing maybe could actually be a team because there might not be one. I, I don't, I don't know. I'm a... <laughs> okay. I, I just looking at the pictures I've provided to us. I mean, it looks like, maybe a squirrel could get through between these two buildings, but I certainly couldn't. And I don't, I can, I don't know. I guess I just don't, I don't know why we, they look like they're too close together. I mean, the eave of one house is over the roof of another, the other house for the barn, I guess. The, the barn of the eave is actually over the addition of the house next door to it. So I don't know. I just, I, that I just, just seems like encroachment to me. Sure, but I think that what, what what what's also part of this process is that it, there could be um, additional rights or something out there um, that would also satisfy the bank's concerns. But I, I really don't want to get into the weeds on this. I think that it, it's just the very specific if that terminology and word is going to be used and, mm -hmm. and you know relied upon in order to talk about financial hardship, um, we need you know facts you know facts on it um, okay. and uh, whatnot. So. And, and that's an if, that's something that we have paid attention to as board members and other other witnesses as well have talked about the encroachment. It may be that the applicant chooses to make a different line of reasoning and argument as to the financial hardship that, that, that and that is up to, up to the applicant. So what I'm hearing is that when it comes to the demolition of the shed itself, which is attached to the barn, so it's hard to separate the issues, but when we're talking about the demolition of the shed that itself, we as a board would like additional evidence that it is a financial hardship to repair the shed in place. And we've heard some descriptions of why it's in bad shape, but we haven't seen numbers that show what makes it so difficult. So- hey, Kate, can I interject real quick? This is Michael. Sure, yeah. So if we're requiring the applicant in this instance to provide that information, then in sort of full faith here and, and giving everyone all the information, then we should probably explain why we didn't require this 
from the previous applicant with a historic home with uh, the enclosed porch that was being disconnected from the home. We didn't ask for any of this. We didn't ask for any estimates. We we did. We received, we received verbal testimony from a contractor that had been hired and had assessed the property. And that well, verbal I, testimony, well, that verbal we're testimony going to this was accepted. evidentiary level here with other members, a verbal, I mean, I'm sorry, but a, a verbal confirmation from a contractor whose skills and qualifications we didn't ask for, nor did we inquire how did he get to that number. All he said is it was going to be cost prohibitive. He and said it was what, going, he estimated that, that, it would be about fifty thousand dollars. And you know, I, I wanna I wanna view this I mean, case think, on its own. I think we're, we're I think we need to stay within the bounds of the staff report and have these discussions when we go into our deliberative session. Cause I, I think we're we're changing the, the goalposts here for the applicants. And I don't think I don't think we're providing clear guidance in a fair way. Okay. Um I, I appreciate that you're keeping an eye on the fairness and the goalposts. Um, it's our job as DRB members to decide whether we have enough evidence to determine the whether the standards have been met for demolition. And what I'm hearing from the board is that we don't have that evidence. And so it's our prerogative to, to ask for it. Um, if there was a contractor here, we might be having a discussion about it, but because there's not, um, it's appropriate to continue the hearing until that evidence is received. If we were to discuss this in deliberative session, we would have closed the hearing and no further evidence could be accepted. Um, and so that's that's why this is different. So I'm, I'm gonna move on. Um, we have determined that we need more, more evidence before we can answer the 3004. Board members, please nod or shake your heads. Yes. Okay. And Michael, I, I hear you yeah, shaking I your head. Like I, don't, I don't think okay. we need additional information. And if we do, we need to be clear about what it is and requiring the applicant to go back to her bank for further information. I, I, I mean, that's beyond, it, in my I, mind, I, that's, that's I, beyond I, the request for an applicant. I mean, that, I, I think I, we're asking I, for I, too I, much. I agree with Michael on this one. Okay. Okay. I so also it, agree with Michael. Okay. So it's up to the applicant whether they want to go to the bank and pursue the financial hardship related to the mortgage. Um, I think in order for this board to understand about the shed itself, we need to see estimates of what it would cost to rehabilitate it versus knock it down. Rob? Yes, I would just, for the point of discussion, maybe moving things forward, make a motion to continue this hearing until the July 6th um, regular meeting of the DRB, um, giving to give the applicant time to provide additional information on um, their financial hardship or any reason of why um, you know this uh, demolition of the shed um, should be uh, approved um, under um, the sections also adjacent to uh, financial uh, hardship. Okay, there's a motion from Rob. Is there a second? I'll second it. There's a second from Kevin, and now we can begin discussion. Yeah. Um, I would like to note that it could be a good use of our and other folks time to look at the other pieces of the staff report and close the hearing after we've had a chance to look at the general standards. Um, and that, that would be my preference, but I'm interested in knowing the will of the board. That's my preference. So I've been, I've been just waiting for you to say that and continue in, in going through the staff report before motions are, are even. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's good that we had the motion in order to get the discussion going, but I would support continuing through the other criteria. Okay. So we have a motion. The motion can either be withdrawn or we can vote on it. I'm not going to withdraw it. Okay. I retract my second. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to disclose this is where I, I'm going to look to a parliamentarian I would, perhaps. I, would, I withdraw my motion. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would like to Thanks, continue. Thanks, thank you all. Um, 
I would like to continue the discussion of this. I appreciate the brain power everyone's put into this and the fact that we've been sitting in front of commuter, computers for 90 minutes. So I'd like to propose a seven minute break to return at 837. When we return, we will review the general standards. As we enter that part of the discussion, I'm going to again put Meredith on the spot and ask her to clarify for us the way that we are reviewing the accessory structure as distinct from the demolition piece of things. Because we've been talking about standards having to do with the demolition of the shed. Another part of what's happening here um, that would have been an administrative permit is the moving of the barn. So I'm going to ask Meredith when we return to give us an overview of, of the standards pertaining to the movement of the accessory structure. And with that, I'll see you all at 8.30. I want to confirm that um, that Michael is, is with us. Michael, are you back? Okay, I see Amanda, thanks. Um, I want to confirm, Allison, are you back? Yes, I'm here. Thanks. And um, I'll ask again if, if Michael's back. Okay. Um, we have enough. We have enough DRB members to proceed. So I'm going to go ahead. Um, first, I'm going to thank you all for your patience. Um, I appreciate it. I appreciate that we're asking questions and taking time to do that. Um, I know there could be more efficiency, um, but I. I uh, appreciate that we're, we're building some understanding and, and getting things solved, even if it's not always pretty. So with that, I'm going to return to the criteria. Um, what I would like to do, I want to move on from the demolition standards. Um, and get into the next part of the staff report that is the use standards. Uh, oh, we, did have a, we did have a question from Steamer, and I know Brooke has her hand up. Um, Okay, we're gonna we're gonna take three to five minutes to wrap up what we talked about um, to in, to inform us, and then we need to move on. So um, go ahead, go ahead, Steamer, and then and then Brooke. Um, it, it appears to me from reading section three thousand four D two to to four that that only right relates to demolition of an income producing property and this is clearly not an income producing property it's going to be a barn and, and it's not going to be rented out okay so this this whole discussion is is irrelevant thank you for that question meredith could you speak to that please um yeah so so this so we still have to consider the undue financial hardship, whether it's income producing or non-income producing. Um, and because I, I understand that the barn itself, um, well, the sh it's the property, part of the property is being rented out. I mean, maybe, Allison is is the because I can't ask Allison questions. Um, There's not I, yeah. really good definition of how to make that differentiation, but there is at least part of the parcel as a whole that is used to bring in income, and that's why I voted to go with that standard in the staff report. If the board, I mean, the staff report is suggestions. Mm -hmm. If the board is free to review the entire provision and say, oh, this is what you said we should use, but we really think you should be using the non-income producing properties standard, um, right? So income producing properties is the building site or object cannot be feasibly used or rented at a reasonable rate of return in its present condition or if rehabilitated and denial of the application would deprive the owner of all reasonable use of the property, which in this case, I would mean the 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 shed right if you don't demolish it you still can't use it um the other option is for a non-income producing property which so far generally in our review has meant a single family home 
because otherwise the applicant, the owner is usually making money off of somewhere on the property. That standard is the building site or object has no beneficial use as a residential dwelling or for an institutional use in its present state or if rehabilitated and denial of the application would deprive the owner of all reasonable use of the property. So it just, this didn't seem to fit in that mold for me, but if the board felt like that's where it should go, then that's a possibility as well. Okay, so this is something, um, in order to move on, I think this is something that would like additional information on from the applicant, the extent to which the property as a whole is an income producing property and the extent to which the little shed is an income producing property. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, again, thank you for bearing with us. Um, Brooke, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm a little concerned about how this process is unfolding and it goes to the issue of when an applicant comes uh, for permission to get something, they are, they are the ones who frame the issues, who say, I'm entitled to a permit because, and the because needs to be because it's a financial hardship or the other reason, it's a benefit to the, a substantial benefit to the community. Sorry about the dog barking. Um, and, and so now instead of the, the applicant choosing where, which direction they're going and what their standard is of proof here, um, you know, you're saying, well, we get to figure out where they go and we'll apply it wherever we can. And now you're giving them another bite at the apple to go back. Excuse me. Just Sorry, I have two dogs to keep track of. But my concern is that you're putting on the application for the applicant. Now you're sending them back to go retrieve more evidence that they didn't come with. And the decision should be you didn't provide the evidence to prove that this is a substantial benefit to the community of Montpelier or that there is a financial, <laughs> there is a significant financial hardship. And those standards aren't, oh, go get us some more information and this is what you should get. I want a letter from the credit union that says more than what you gave us. I want to talk about this and that. Tell us about obstructions. The bottom line is they haven't pre presented evidence to support their application. And right now, you guys are sitting there trying to figure out whether it's an income producing property or not. Why is the applicant not planting their feet and saying, this is what I'm applying for? I'm applying for it because it's an income producing property and I can demonstrate under the many other analyses that are laid out in your uh, section 3000. Um, this is what we go and talk about. That's what she should have come with today to say it's an income producing property and it's gonna be a financial hardship. Or you know the other avenue, which is I have no reasonable beneficial use of my property. It's a regulatory taking if I can't move it. It's sort of the same legal standard. And I'm very concerned that not only staff, but now the DRB is helping the applicant put together their presentation. She obviously has not presented the information sufficient to clear the bar. And now we're gonna go send her off on an errand to come back yet again. <laughs> I object to this process. You are a judge and no, I, that's where I disagree. This is not a professional <laughs> setting. This is not a, a law office. She is not a lawyer. She does not have professional representation. And if we held everyone to that standard, no one would get anything done because this is a civilian board. We're not professionals. Nor a court of law. Yeah, exactly. That's the term I was looking for. Thank you. Well, but this I, is I, I don't process. Uh, I think we need to get this rating back in on the staff report and thank with you. all due respect and we've heard the, the argument from, from Brooke and, and we get it. Yeah. And I think we just need to continue on. But, and not but let me just finish, finish if I could just finish my thought. The problem is you leave me now unable, I, now I have to not know what we're doing. I have to deal with every shotgun approach here. Well, but this isn't, this isn't- Michael, Michael, the, please, like, please let Brooke finish. Well, I, I think where I think this is getting- Michael, project, please, I think... I, I'm gonna say, I'm going to bring this back around. Um, I, I appreciate the, 
interest in keeping it on track. Um, but Brooke, just in, in well, I'm 20 just trying seconds, to wrap up please. My point. My point is we don't know what the application is about. And now you're going to have a new hearing. We're going to show up again, not knowing what the heck's going on and have to respond to it on the, on the spot. That's not fair to us. I think you should set a date that says whatever evidence you go and collect and bring to us, you have to give us by set date and give us then an opportunity to respond to it so that we can't, this is a very difficult setting to do it in. I can't cross examine a witness and get all the information I want out so that then I can make my point to you. So if okay. I can do that in advance. Okay. Thank you. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take any more any more public comments on this. Um, though I appreciate people's interest. I am going to echo Joe's comment that this is a quasi judicial process. That this is a place where we're trying to have neighbors talk to each other. Where we're ha trying to help. Um, people who may not have been through the DRB before um, come through the DRB. That does not mean doing the application for them. This means making sure that as a quasi-judicial quasi board, we have the information that we need. This board has precedent over many years of continuing hearings in order to have adequate information um, rather than voting applications down because of inadequate information. Um, and, and Kevin, I see you're unmuted. Um, if you wanted to add something as the longest serving board member, you'd be welcome. I, I, I just wanted to support the comments that Kate just made. Uh, th this, this is very important that we, we don't get into this tit for tat kind of uh, 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 battle ground. Uh, that's not what this board is about. That's not what this process is about. And Kate's comments are the best summary. Thank you, Kevin. I also want to note that the materials usually come out the Thursday or Friday before the meeting, and that is when the board sees them. And those are also available to the public at that time on, uh, on our website. And that is um, several days before the meeting. I acknowledge that it includes a weekend, um, but it, the board receives those materials when, when the applicants and interested parties do as well. I'm going to move on. Um, I'm hopefully, hoping that Meredith can rejoin us and um, Michael, I appreciate that you were speaking up and thank you for your understanding that, that we're moving on. I think we've accomplished the goal. Um, sorry, I had to interrupt anybody. Meredith, um, I would like to move into the use, the, the general standards. So the general standards of our zoning are things that apply to everything. We also have some specialized standards depending on what the use is, but those general standards are what we're using to review the project as a whole. Because we're tangled up, um, because we have the demolition of a shed attached to a barn that's moving. I'm going to ask Meredith to untangle us a little bit and talk about what standards do and do not apply to the movement of the barn so that we can then walk through those standards, to ask questions of the applicant, which, which do constitute evidence, and see what we can determine. So if I may, Meredith, please. Okay. Um, so... Out of the staff report, the items that really apply to the barn here um, under Chapter 300 um, for moving the barn, we're really going to be looking at Sections 3002 and 3003 about the dimensional standards. Um, in this instance, because the primary, if you're talking about where exactly you're moving the barn to and the setbacks from property boundaries, um, in some instances, accessory structures will have more lenient setbacks um, than a primary structure. But in this case, because it's in residential um, 1500, the um, primary setbacks, the standard ones for all your initial buildings are the most lenient, um, even more than the 3003 special accessory structure setback allowances. Um, so you don't even really need to look at 3003 in this instance. It's really just the 3002 standards for Res 1500. Those are where we're going to apply. Um, and you're going to be looking at setbacks and um, really, and, and coverage in those dimensional standards. Nothing else is really getting affected by this. Um, then you're going to jump ahead and um, sorry, I'm skimming through the things that don't apply because they don't have those on this property. Um, you know, erosion control section 3008 can be considered and 3009 stormwater management. That's really the bulk of what I think 
we're looking at. Um, you know, the, the sometimes in something like this where you're dealing with moving a garage or placing a garage or some barn that's going to be used as a garage, you would look at um, maybe access and circulation and parking and loading areas. I didn't see that those were really being changed much. Um, there's a driveway that that length, the, the barn is still going to be there and able, if it's sound, able to be used as parking, which I maybe it is now that's something i guess to confirm with allison um but i didn't see that this application was impacting those two so 3002 and then erosion control and stormwater okay <clears throat> thank you and so meredith are there any other standards within the zoning bylaw besides those that are used to evaluate the location or the impact or the aesthetics or the effect of an accessory structure in the zoning district not with regard to a single or two family parcel. When okay. And for, for the sake of those who don't read the zoning bylaw every two weeks, um, which is fine. Um, I just want to note that um, there are additional standards in a zoning bylaw that apply if you're talking about three or more units on a piece of property, but the state law that tells towns what it can and can't do says that you can't do certain types of review when there are one or two units on the parcel. So that's just a little bit of background as to why we're looking at what we're looking at. Okay. And I think that's important, important for abutters to, to know the constraints that, that we're working within. So um, let's, let's go in order. Um, section 3002 is dimensional standards. Um, and those have to do with how far from the edge of a property line a building needs to be. So in this district, parcels need to be 3,000 square feet. The coverage can be a maximum of 60% of the parcel. That means driveways and houses and roofs and things. Setbacks in the front are 10 feet, side 5 feet minimum, rear 10 feet minimum, and from water need to be 25 feet minimum. Um, the building height maximum is 35 feet. So um, I want to ask Allison, um, how many feet from the side property line is the barn proposed to be? Because we, we do see some detail that it is beyond the five feet as required, but um, I know that earlier there was a question about, the, about how far from the property line it would actually be. Uh, would, would you give that another try, Allison? I think that the, the phone is blippy again. I have that number. Okay. All right. Um, but we do see that um, it, you, you would testify that it, it is outside of the five-foot setback, so it is, it is outside the five-foot setback. It's more than five feet. So it is more, more than, than five feet. feet. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, staff report highlights um, the conditions around a non-conforming structure. Um, I'm gonna take comments and questions at the end after we run through this, um, just so folks know. Um, and I'm gonna, those will be limited, but we'll start with the board. Um, the, it's a 640 square foot barn being moved to the rear of the parcel. The existing location will be seated with grass. The total coverage on the site will be re reduced because something will be demolished. Any continuing coverage in excess of the 60% maximum would be a nonconformity that could remain as the alteration to the barn did not increase the degree of nonconformity. So um, that's just important to note. Um, as we just discussed, it will be at least 10 feet from the real, rear parcel boundary and more than five feet from each of the side boundaries. The barn is behind the main house and the front setback is more than that. Um, I want to see if DRB members have questions about the dimensional standards, um, how the barn does or does not, about the barn's adherence to the dimensional standards. Okay. Um, 
so the next thing we're going to look at, we already talked about demolition and we got as far as we're going to get with that tonight. Um, I'm going to take questions at the, at the end after we go through the general standards. So as Meredith noted, um, the sections pertaining to riparian areas, wetlands and vernal pools, steep slopes um, are not implicated because those things aren't present on the site. So that brings us to two other sections um, for the board to evaluate. Section 3008 is erosion control and section 3009 is stormwater management. So um, there are requirements in this section that come into play when certain amount of land on steep sl slopes is being cleared. That's not happening in this case. Um, however, the project will be required to implement and comply with the erosion control practices within the zoning bylaw. Um, so I'd like to spend a little time on stormwater management. Um, so this requires that storm sewer system and other drainage improvements shall be in accordance with plans approved by the Director of Public Works. Will there be, um, Allison, this is a question for you, will there be any sort of treatment of the stormwater from the barn once you move it that is drained into the storm sewer system? What will, how will, another way for me to ask that is, how will the stormwater be handled on the newly moved barn? You know, I I just got to say, I didn't know I needed to prepare these things. Um, and unfortunately, I got caught in a thunderstorm and I, I wasn't able to make it home. Um, you know, I don't have that information right now. I mean, okay. it's the, the I was going to follow the zoning. Um, it would not go into the sewer system. Um, I would comply with the requirements for permeable surfaces. Okay. Um, thank you. So um, one of the standards within the stormwater management part of the bylaw is that stormwater drainage shall not negatively affect adjacent properties. And we've talked about stormwater a little bit earlier. We heard from um, Amanda and, Ke and Kevin about that. Um, and the concern of existing in their basement. Um, the there's a requirement to use the best available technology to minimize stormwater runoff, increase on-site infiltration, encourage natural filtration functions, and sim simulate natural drainage systems. Low points in standing water should be avoided. Um, so the staff finding is that this, because this is the same roof, just in a different place, it doesn't increase the rate or flow of stormwater because there's not more paving on the parcel. The new location will have open ground on all four sides of the barn, whereas the current situation, there's not much open ground for infiltration. The building will be closer to 26 Loomis and 18 Liberty um, than the current location. So um, I, I, I would turn to Alice again and ask, um, are there, are there plan? you may have already answered this, but are there, are there, what are the plans to ensure that this does not impact neighboring properties, the, the water uh, off the roof in its new location? That's a high priority for me. Um, and I haven't worked that out with the contractor yet in mm -hmm. detail. I, I certainly will comply with, with all of the requirements, but I don't, I don't have the exact materials. I don't know exactly how we would accomplish that yet. Okay. Um, thank you. So in, in section 3009, it's, it's our job as the quasi judicial board to, to get information that assures us that these standards will be met. So those details will, will be important, um, to the issuance of a permit. Um, yeah, so I'll turn to the DRB members now for questions. Go ahead, Gene. How is it? How is it being managed now? The the stormwater situation, though, because of, from reviewing the application and, and some of the photos, it seems that there's a significant amount of standing water currently in. Um, go, go ahead, Allison, if you want to answer that. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. What? So, 
right now there's there seems from from the application the photos show a significant amount of water that's standing right adjacent to the shed barn so it that's which is so there's a storm water management process here that you, you need to present the, the specifics and the details a, a little better on the application thank it's not yeah presented. thank you for letting thank you for letting me know i i just you know i i didn't know i needed to um put that together okay um, so as, as one board member, I think we need more details to understand the, um, the storm water because as the report notes, um, there won't be an increase in impervious coverage, but where it falls changes and may have different impacts and we need to be able to evaluate those impacts as a board. Um, what do other board members think? Uh, Mary, this is Michael again. I, I, again, I'm going to make the same comment. I, I feel like we're asking this applicant for a level of detail and information that we haven't asked other applicants and that we can simply make a condition of this permit that they work with their contractor to abide by all standard practices for stormwater and, and rain off a, a roof. Okay. Thank you, Michael. What do other DRB members Think. I think we should have a general sense as to what the stormwater management is going to be. I mean, that would probably be one of the most contentious issues with regards to the neighboring properties. Um, and I do believe we have an opportunity. I mean, it's not that hard really to do provide some detail as to what the expectation is uh, for stormwater. So I'm not into a full blown engineering analysis, but certainly some, some, some submission of, uh, of information that gives the general plan, I think would be helpful. I just, yeah, yeah I agree with Kevin and you know, I, I think that it's really important when, uh, you know, citizens come with concerns to this board, um, specific questions that um, information gets submitted and is widely available to the public and an opportunity to comment and ask for questions. And, um, you know, I think that um, that's, that's really important. It's good to see the interest that makes these applications better as what the process is for. And um, so I think that, uh, yeah, the neighbors, uh, you know, and the rest of the public are, are, are owed that, uh, that information. Okay. Thank you, Rob. And I would add on to that, that it's, it's our job as a, a board of, of neighbors and a board of, of Montpelier residents to take into consideration the site specific issues and concerns at each application, which may mean that we request different information from, from different applicants, depending on the likely impacts or possible impacts. Okay. So um, we are, it sounds like we are not able to draw conclusions about um, the general standards, um, mostly because of the stormwater management question. So that's another thing that, um, that this board needs additional evidence to, to review that we ask the applicant to come back with at a subsequent hearing. All right. Um, these are the key standards that we needed to go through together. As Meredith noted, access and circulation, parking and loading areas, and signs are, are not applicable to this. Um, what I would like to do now is give each, um, each person who's spoken two minutes maximum um, to put out any remaining questions or things to consider between now and the next meeting. And then um, Allison, you can have the opportunity very last um, to, to speak and um, then, then we'll, I'll look for a motion. Um, first, I'll see any last questions from DRB members. Okay. Um, Amanda had her hand up quite a while ago. I see Brooke has her hand up now. So I'm going to turn to Amanda and then Brooke, if you'd like to, Amanda. Allison, my phone is going to... Your phone's about to go. Sorry. That's okay. Hi. It's, it's part of getting stranded at battery power. Okay, so less than two minutes if you can, but go ahead, go ahead, Amanda. Hi. Um, so I just want to make known that my... 
my the back of my house is actually the end of our property so therefore the barn would be quite close to our house house if it were to be built but also i don't have a backyard and i have a very small front yard and it definitely doesn't have space for a shed so it definitely would be a benefit to the community and we would totally help her restore that shed if she would be willing to rent out bike space to us and that would be a total benefit to us that we would love to have that space utilized for something for us because right now as you see our bikes are in our living room <laughs> all right. so that, that's all i have to say it's just our property basically abuts them and we have no, no I, and as okay. has been, I, thank I, thank oh. you sorry go ahead Devin. Oh, I missed you. Um, okay, so next I'll go Brooke for two minutes and then uh, Steam Rest, do you have your, your hand up? And then we'll go to Allison who will hopefully have some, some juice on her phone. So um, please go ahead, Brooke, if you like. Yeah, I just want to make a couple of requests. In terms of the setbacks, what are they? Um, at least five feet or 10 feet is not a location. And that is essential that we know what the setbacks are in order for me to be able to hire an expert engineer regarding the stormwater management issue. So I need a location. I can't just say, well, it's going to be at least five feet or at least 10 feet. Um, and you should insist on that. That's what a site plan is all about. It has to have distances. It can't just be floating somewhere on the property within five and 10 feet. In terms of the stormwater management, you have a provision that says um, that it, improvements shall be in accordance with plans approved by the Director of Public Works. Get the Public Works Director to approve a plan. Don't, don't make it less than that and for lay people on a board to look at and to give an okay to. Get the city engineer to actually look at it and do his job according to the way that you have your ordinance written. And lastly, in terms of conditions um, that are arbitrary and capricious, oh, go work it out. We need to have conditions to a permit, if there is one issued, that are very clear, that is noticed to the public, not you guys go figure it out according to whatever standards you might want to use that day. So we're looking for more clarity here. We're looking for factual information so that our side can look at expert opinions about whether stormwater uh, drainage will work according to their experts' plans, but I think you, it is incumbent upon the city to require this. That's the whole issue that is trying to be remedied. Somebody next door apparently built an overhang that drips onto the subject property, and now you're gonna let the subject property try to remedy that by creating a different uh, problem for other neighbors. And I think it's absolutely essential that the stormwater issue is adequately um, provided in terms of expert opinion evidence and then have the city engineer give the okay. Thank you for all your time and I appreciate your uh, listening. And thank you for your time as well, Brooke. Um, and Meredith, I um, understand the criterion about the public works approval to be when it relates to draining into the storm system. I don't know that it calls for that otherwise, but I wonder if you could talk with Public Works about the applicability of this provision. I don't want to take much more of Allison's battery. Yeah, no, and that's 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 one of the things that uh, after this hearing, this part of the hearing, uh, you know, I will help Allison navigate how to respond to the questions and, and requests that have happened tonight, and Me how too. to get you internally here once she gets more information um i'm sorry i know i know steamer wants to say something but just in case i thought it might be worth checking in with allison before she loses power to make sure that she's even available at the next hearing on july 6th mm -hmm. or there is a continuance if it should instead be to the 19th okay I, I thank you That's good question meredith and allison you can go ahead we'll want to make sure to get those ducks in a row uh, before your battery dies. So if this hearing's continued, Allison, is July 6th, are you available on July 6th? I am. You are? Okay, thank you. Um, so go ahead, Steamer, a couple, uh, couple minutes, and then um, Allison, and then we'll entertain a motion. Um, I just wanna <clears throat> remind the board that we, we have here an applicant who is trying to preserve 
and the historic structure, the barn itself. Um, and we're getting all tangled up in the whether the shed it's workable or it, it doesn't make sense. I'm afraid we're going to lose the, the whole thing if it's not, if this permit is not allowed. That's what I have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. And Allison, um, if you'd like to go ahead and comment and um, as, as clear as you can be given the garble. So please go ahead so, if you'd like to say anything else. Me? Can you it's quite broken up. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. It, just so we can see by this process, I is to approve to demolish addition to a historic structure is our down. And just feels like it wandered in so much territory that I didn't feel like people understood. I'm, I'm so sorry, Allison. I really value what you're saying as we're wrapping up here and, and we are, we're not able to hear properly. I heard you say you came into demolish in addition to a historic structure, but you feel it's entered into a certain territory. Well, it's a, it's a good time for that motion. Yeah, I, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, I, think I, a, I, I think we've heard a lot from the applicant and uh, yeah. we, we, we know what we need to do. Okay, we, we've done our best. There will be another opportunity to talk. Um, I would entertain a motion regarding this application. Uh, Rob, now's a good time for that same motion. From whomever wishes to provide a motion to continue this hearing to a time and date certain. I'll make a motion to continue this uh, application to the next regularly scheduled DRB meeting, which is on July 6, 2021. Um, so the applicant has more time to provide information on um, their rationale for approval of demolition of a contributing historic structure and also for um more detailed uh site plan information regarding uh you know stormwater and the exact layout of the proposed um new barn um and um any other information that uh that staff or the applicant deem necessary to uh make this more um complete we have a motion is there a second second there's a second from gene May I offer a friendly amendment, Rob, in that when you said site plan, we are not requiring site plan because it's not possible for a two family dwelling, but we mean a sketch of how the site will be used and where the location of the barn will be um, in order to understand stormwater and impacts as, as discussed. I can place, replace the word sketch uh, wherever site plan was said. That is a excellent word. I love the word sketch. I call everything sketch. Very good. Very sketchy. <laughs> All right. Um, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Amend historic barn versus new barn. All right, we'll take we'll take the we'll take the vote. Rob. Yes. Kevin. Yes. Jean. Yes. Michael. No. Um, Joe. Yes. And I vote yes as well. We will. Pick this up again with additional evidence provided to the board and the public um, prior to the July 6th meeting. We will talk about this at our July 6th meeting. I really appreciate all of your participation. Thank you. Uh, folks are welcome to stay on if they like. We're gonna move on to the next item in our agenda, which is other business, and it's discussing a return to in-person meetings. Okay. All right.
Yes. Hey, uh, this is Brooke. Sorry to interrupt again. Um, but Courtney is not available on July 6th, and we were wondering if there was any way that the applicant would be willing to kick it to, I think you said the 19th, when she would be back in town. Um, the, the, the motion has passed. We're, we're about to discuss how yeah, we're going the, to do meetings, and my... Um, intention is that we will maintain a remote option even as we return to in-person meetings and um i'm hopeful that that can be adequate thank you anyway okay thank you uh meredith did you want to say something you guys dealt with it okay so um meredith sent us an email or cameron niedermeyer uh, assistant town manager city manager sent us an email um, saying that the state of emergency has um, has ended, um, which means that the provisions that allowed us to meet remotely, th those circumstances are no longer. And so it's our job to return to in-person meetings. Um, ish, we have the prerogative to allow, there, there needs to be some way for the public to appear in person should they choose. And Meredith has said that she is going to be appearing in council chamber, city council chamber, so that that is possible for anyone who wants to be there in person. This board needs to discuss and decide how it is going to convene. Um, I want to say that I think staff and the board have done an incredible job. Thank you, Amanda. Um, an incredible job with the development review by Zoom. It has not been easy. Um, we've tried to take complex matters in a way that are fair to everybody. Um, and I appreciate it. Um, the professionalism, the focus, the attendance. Um, I also think it's been a really important way to allow people to listen in and participate. I think it's a easier way to participate for some, and particularly those who have obligations at home in the evening with caregiving. So, um, it's sometimes hard to manage the back and forth. Um, I think we can all, all be candid about that and I invite participants to be as well. Um, but I think having a remote option of some sort is an important way to help people access the process. I think it's a, a silver lining that we can take from this COVID period. So I'd like to have a discussion, but what I'm gonna start with as a straw dog is to propose that we return to in-person me meetings for board members, but retain a remote option for participants. There are some computer things that would need to be worked out. Um, I would propose starting this as a pilot um, and reevaluating it um, after two months, maybe six, maybe after maybe after six months with a three month check in, whatever we decide. Um, I want to understand how any option affects our participation as well as staff prep requirements and others. So. I'm throwing that out there as a starting point for conversation, and I'd, I'd love to hear from board members uh, what your thoughts are. Kate, I think you nailed it. I mean, uh, the um, the pandemic has been an incredible challenge. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about the first couple of meetings we had and how we were kind of tripping over our our uh, shoelaces, uh, just trying to get oriented. Um, and I, for one, am overjoyed to start meeting again in person. But you know. The uh, uh, we've all been zoomed at this point, and we might as well make the best use of that that we can. And I really do think that there is a role for it uh, as far as the public's participation. So it's important to have the public meetings available for those who don't have this access or the capability. I mean, that's just essential. And I'm glad Meredith is just going to be present. But I personally have found the Zoom structure is it's convenient to me. I mean, I work out of my house and, you know, I could be mowing the lawn and then pop in at 630 and get ready and I'm there versus taking a shower, leaving my house, driving, going downtown, parking, you know, going through that whole. So personally, it, it's been pretty convenient in that aspect. And, and you, your point is t well taken, Gene. I mean, as far as, I mean, we, we struggle as a city to, to have adequate representation from this, you know, citizen boards. Uh, recruiting is difficult. And if you have the option, I don't know how you manage that exactly, but right. conceptually, I certainly, I certainly am in agreement. 
<clears throat> Any other thoughts? So Meredith, is it really true? I I can show up at seven o'clock on July sixth, and I can actually go to the council chambers and. Yep. Yep. Wow. So so, um, as of the July sixth meetings, um, City Hall will be open during the meeting hours. So that's D or C and D or B for people to come into council chambers. Um, what we have set up for technology right now is that I will probably have my own work laptop in the room um, so that I can control and still host the Zoom. Um, there will also be a computer station um, in, you know, at the table in the middle um, for um, people who are there in person to be able to interact. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, we haven't quite, I haven't quite conceptually understood it all yet. Um, my understanding is that Orca is still going to be streaming like they were with the discussion um, from the board members and that um, there will also still be a microphone for people to talk to, but really they should be talking into the laptop. So if we have an applicant there and we have members of the public there, they might need to trade off on the laptop to be able to have that go out into the Zoom world for anybody who's tuning in that way. Um, and Orca media, so is Orca doing it, the, the, the managing the video feed through the Zoom or are they also putting this on the tube or on TV. Well, I mean, it's not like they've been they've been doing it going over oh. the work of media live stream, right? That's been happening all along. Oh. Streaming these Zoom discussions. Um, if we have members who are coming into city council chambers, just like before, we'll have a member of your know, employee of Orca. They're handling the technical feed changes mm -hmm. um, over. The live stream, which will also be, it'll all be worked in. Right. The, the, the thing to note is that, that we do go in person on July 6th. Instead of having city council be the guinea pigs, we're going to be the guinea pigs. Um, because city council doesn't meet again until July 21st. Right. Um, which, I mean, is, we can do that, uh, but that would mean if, if we're going live in, you know, in person in July, we're going to have two meetings before city council meets again. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you were aware. <laughs> so we'd be the guinea pigs? We would be the guinea pigs. DRC and DRB would be the guinea pigs. So yeah. if I, if, I mean, if I, if I want, if I want to be there in person, Am I going to have the connectivity I need if I bring in my iPad or my laptop or? Theoretically. Theoretically. Um, okay. I don't know is they have mapped it all out. And I don't think that there are, they, I don't think they have wired all those desks. I'm not well, sure. I mean, we, we have the method we used before, which was actually printed copy. Would that be useful as an interim? Um, well, I was also thinking of if you right now, probably if you want your faces to be on Zoom, you would need your laptop. If yeah. you don't worry about that, um, and it's the, you know, other, having your voice on Zoom, right, then um, it's, you would need your laptop and we could do printed copies. I am going to suggest that if at all possible, we don't go back to fully printed copies. There right. are a lot of efficiencies. Um, yeah. And if it was printed copies, I would be bringing this to the meeting, I think. I think we would still send out the email versions um, ahead of the meetings and then just bring printed copies to the meeting itself yeah. would be my suggestion um, versus trying to use the police department again to hand out packets. Are they against the uh, the concept of, uh, of uh, being the distribution center? Um, so one, if I have one system 
in place in general, it's it's just going to be efficiency wise a little easier. Um, it's here's a, here's. A, I'm muted. B, I, I wonder if I could just interject, and it's it's getting late. And if if we if we do want to do printed packets, let's talk about the the, the logistics of those in another setting. Um, okay. I, I think I, I, our next we could talk about that in another setting for sure. Just a reminder that we're going to need to talk about that really soon because if we have to plan for printed packets, I need to know we need to do that by July. Sure. I mean, I think we can do that by email and not run afoul of any 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 open meeting laws. So um, I'm sorry I had to step away for a second. Um, you can also, like, for those who might not have a laptop, you, you know, you could ask each member, like, I might need a packet that day because I don't have a laptop yeah. for it. And then have a couple for the public if they want it there. Yeah. Like, so you know, the city council meeting. Yeah. So I think, I think packet logistics are a little less important than um, deciding how we're going to meet. And I, I apologize that I had to step away. Is is there a is there a will of the group as far as whether we get together on July 6th versus experimenting, uh, get, letting city council experiment? Um, put straw poll, who, who wants to convene in person as a DRB in city council chambers on July 6th? One, two. Who does... Oh, three, 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 three. And Michael? Four. I, I want to be yeah, in person. <laughs> you want to be in person, Michael? Okay. Is there anyone who doesn't want to be in person? Okay. I think that tells us we're going to experiment with it. Um, can we also do a remote option? That's, I mean, that's the, that's the plan. Okay. Um, is to have an option for people to remote in via. Okay. And Thank you. I know that's extra work for you and others. Um, do folks have access to a tablet or a laptop so that they can be seen on Zoom if they choose from council chambers? Raise your hand if you do. Okay. So, okay. So what we can do is, um, Meredith, this is an additional step, but I, 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 again, like as we figure this out for the whole city, um, I wonder if you could ask around and see if there are some some laptops that are extra within the city. I know the city doesn't collect extra technology um, and uses its budget well, but are there some uh, late some not currently being used laptops, even if they're older, that would allow um, make it so that people participating in city government don't have to buy their own computers? Um, I'll even see, if it's just one. Yep, yeah, I'll I'll see what I can find out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, my understanding is that um, board members who didn't have a laptop to be able to do that um, would still be able, like their voices would carry on to Zoom through that center. That center laptop has a really, really strong microphone. Okay. Um, it just, their people who are bringing their laptops may have an issue um, with the sound then so all the speaking in person, right? Mm. Delaying through the laptops. Okay. So if you, you know, you're, you're, you might not want your sound on on the laptop when you're there. Right. You might right. Need headphones or something. It's just to flag that out there. Okay. Um, I can, I can check. I'm going to hazard a guess that it is unlikely that there are three or more laptops available that are not already designated. Okay. Let's try for one and see, see where that gets us. Um, this is, this is a new world. It would be ideal if people could arrive at six 30, but I know that imposes on people's evenings. Um, if people could arrive sometime between six 30 and six 45 for our next meeting, that would be really tremendous. I think that's a good idea, Kate. Okay. And I, yeah, I, and um, we, can, we can talk about details via, you know, uh, email. Or yeah. Whatever. And our, our our plan B will that we will have a Zoom call in option for the public, but we will not appear in our fa our faces will not appear, but our voices will. That will be our our plan B if necessary. Um, that's our our packets, the digital packets, will be available to board members and to the public, so that that access will be maintained and people can be in touch with Meredith if they want printed packets. 
Well, Anything else? I'll make sure that there are, you know, even if nobody has requested printed packets, I'll make sure there are some at the meetings. Um, I always had extra before. Um, so we okay. can do at least a few, even if nobody wants to. Okay, thank you. Um, don't mean to rush things along, but here we are. Um, any other comments on returning to in-person meeting besides Hooray? I second that. Um, okay, great. Um, so our next meeting is Tuesday, July 6th. Are there any other applications besides the one that has been um, tabled or continued? Yes. Yes, there are. Yeah, there are. Okay. Two others. Okay. Two others. Okay. So um, we'll start with the continued application. That's usually what we do. And then we'll move into the others um, as completely and fairly as possible. Um, there, it, there was an outstanding request. I don't think we can talk about it anymore. Um, the meeting has been set for the continuation of the public hearing on Liberty Street. So that, that will, that's where we'll continue. Um, any last words? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Is there any discussion? I'll call the roll. Joe? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Jean? Yes. Rob? Yes. Michael? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Really appreciate your time and your thinking tonight. Um, thanks to, to the public who participated and the applicants as well. I uh, appreciate everybody's work. It's um, appreciated. Good night. And, they, and I wanted to thank you uh, publicly for your steady hand throughout all of this. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a team effort, but I appreciate that. All right. All right. Good night, folks. Good night, everybody. Good night.